Hello YouTube, my guest today is Rick Wright. Rick has been doing stand-up and musical comedy since the 1970s. He's been in a double act called Rick and Ruby, and they went on tour with Robin Williams. Rick has been living in the UK since 2003, and he, he's got a brain full of memories, so I thought he'd be a good guy to get, get on the show. Welcome to the show, Rick. Thanks. Great to be here. So where where were you born then? That's that's the first place we're going to look at. Uh, Brooklyn, New York. Brooklyn, um, yeah. And uh, near the near the coast, near uh, Coney Island. Uh, Coney Island. Yeah. Uh, I I never knew if it was an island or not, but it, <laughs> um, we left there when I was three months old because um, my dad had finished his uh, undergraduate. He'd gotten his uh, degree from Brooklyn College, and so then he got accepted into a master's program at U of Nebraska. But I, I had, you know, I only went to that Coney Island area once in my life, and that was when I was uh, about thirteen. When we were doing an East Coast swing, we were living in Arizona by then. But we, I remember it, it just looked really. It looks much better now. If this is a modern picture, because it looked like a total ghetto when we were there. Um, you know, just so was it quite rough back in the day? Oh, yeah, you know, Brooklyn was uh, was one of the tougher areas of New York. Probably still is. Uh, that's where you got uh, a lot more of the the mob people. They're either based there or New Jersey, if, yeah. from, from what I recollect. Um, but yeah, there were just uh, the Brooklyn accent is kind of like that. You know, you. Uh, I remember our grand grandmother was taking care of me and my brother, and uh, and she just had this thick accent. She said, hey, "Will all of be quiet? Yeah, you know, he's, he's giving me a headache." And you know, she just had that 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 New York Jewish accent. Um, and and my other cousin was with us. I'm not a yiz, and that became his nickname until I was like, I'm not a what? I'm not a yiz. Cause, what does that mean? Well, she kept saying, "Well, will all yiz be quiet?" Oh, all yiz, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he's going, "I'm not a yiz." <laughs> so who's that? So that was your dad's parents. That my, yeah, my dad's okay. mom. My my dad's father died when I was about oh, just after we moved to Nebraska. I mean, he was he just. Uh, chain smoked right up until and he was only about uh 60 when he died something like that but there's one surviving picture of me sitting on his lap when i'm just a baby um otherwise you know i don't i don't really know didn't really know him yeah. um you know my and my parents well my dad died in 2018 or 2016 i mean <laughs> died in the future yeah. uh and my mom in 2005 so yes i'm an orphan finally um, actually, today's my brother's birthday. I got to remember to call him. But anyway, um, no, I'll tell. You, I'll email you afterwards to tell. Yes, you. indeed. Um, yeah, but the time in Brooklyn, I, I remember nothing of it because, uh, and and actually, when we moved to Nebraska, I don't remember much of that either because we only lived there for about two years. So that's the next place, right? Yeah, we, we moved to Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, my dad on on this street, somewhere around there. Yeah. It was near the university. I'm I'm quite sure. Um, and we lived there uh, for two years. Uh, my dad got his master's, and then um, then we moved to Austin, Texas, where we stayed for a year or so. We, we moved about a lot. Um, How, why did you move them out so much? He was doing postgraduate studies. Uh, my mom got a, a job at the, uh, at the the Central Library, which then was in the news about 10 years later where the this guy climbed to the top of the, the tower of the library and just started shooting at people. This was oh, like really? years before all the mass. I mean, this was in 1966 this mm -hmm. happened. Um, but it was the same place my mom worked, and it had a big clock tower at the top, and that's where this guy climbed up with just an arsenal of weapons and started shooting indiscriminately and killed, I think, 13 people altogether before the cops finally got oh, up. Oh, my God. What, uh, what was the name of that guy? Charles Whitman, um, I still remember that. Was that like a terrorist thing, or was it? He was just—he was just insane. Just insane. He, yeah. he had killed his mother and his and his wife before that, um, and then just you know had snapped. He was a a military guy that um, knew about they're fire. the scariest ones, man. They they have all oh, the training. Yeah. Yes, uh, they're they're still uh, they still scare me. Uh, I I had dealt with that in the '60s of 
the military people. Well, I was a draft dodger, actually. Oh, uh, really? Yes. What did you What did you do to avoid it? Um, well, I just had a really bad case of acne. That uh, acne. You can it, stay out of the army with acne. Uh, at that time, that. it was good enough. I had. I I was cursed with. You know, it was hereditary. My dad had it's it. Weird my thing about it. it seems pretty like if you can get out with acne. Yeah. The, they how had, hard could it be? It, yes. They had enough yeah, yeah. people. Um, and I had a doctor who just a dermatologist who was very liberal and yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. so he anti-war. So he, you know, and I went to him just on a, as a total shot in the dark because I was I had dropped out of college and my draft number they had a lottery that year and my birth date came up thirty out of the three hundred sixty six possible birth dates so it meant that I was going to go in the first first round you know I, I'd pretty much get shipped out and have to go to Vietnam, which, you know, didn't really want to do. And so they, uh, uh, the doctor just wrote this thing, made me sound like a total freak. I mean, I was under medication, but what he said was, it's intense medication that uh, would not be available in a military environment, and it's and made it sound contagious, you yeah, know, yeah, like yeah, I'd infect yeah, other yeah. people. And the military doctor took a look because i had it on my back too and he the doctor looked at it and said yeah they won't take you so because they figured that we can get enough people from elsewhere so so did you have you must have had friends that went out there then um most of my friends well one of them uh, got arrested for draft evasion um and had to do he had to get out on a psychological i mean he had he was seeing a shrink at the time, so the shrink was able to get him out. But uh, there were other people who either got arrested or uh, one went to Canada, one went to one just went ahead and enlisted uh, just because he didn't have any options. Um, I mean, it's a terrible thing that you had to serve your country whether you wanted to or not back then. And uh, they didn't abolish the draft until after the Vietnam War ended. Um, so, uh, I mean, it's just a, a terrible thing, uh, sending, sending people. And I, I worked in 1995 and 96, I worked in, uh, military bases in Japan and Korea. And these were kids fresh out of high school who were like 18 years old. And suddenly they're 10,000 miles away from their families. And I just felt really bad for them. Plus the the ratio of men to women was like 10 to 1 or something. So uh, I imagine the, uh, the the sex trade was a, you know, that, that was a busy one. When the guys yeah, got yeah, their yeah, pay, yeah. Uh, they probably went to the, the houses first. I bet they did. Um, I mean, that's like, yeah, to go out there when you were 17, I can't even imagine what yeah, that would do to your brain, right? And, that's like your first experience <clears throat> of being in the world is... Yeah, yeah and, yeah. and you've, you've never been away from home. Yeah, and Suddenly yeah, yeah. you're... Uh, you know, shipped out there, and um, yeah, it was. It was um, the they had they were pretty receptive actually to what I was doing. Um, and of course, one one of the two years I went there, I was working with a guy who was a total jerk, total hack, and very conservative, and um, you know, and mostly worked cruise ships. You know, ten years later, I worked cruise ships. Um, but back then I just, I hated those guys cause they were all hacks and they all just, uh, well, I'll do anything. Just love me. <laughs> and, um, so he did a little juggling and he, he was getting on me about language. And, uh, when we were having lunch in the, the commons with the military people and he was getting on my case about that. And meanwhile, on stage, uh, he, his retort to a heckler was uh, uh let's shut that guy up put a dick in his mouth classic and classic and i thought and he's on me for saying fuck but you know the uh the logic that we had to adhere to was if say the colonel's wife is there and she hears someone say fuck and uh it doesn't and she doesn't like it she can complain and everybody's fired you know it's that it was that that kind of catch 22 i guess yeah, yeah, yeah. um but the, yeah this guy was such a hypocrite um and you know i i was he was based in florida and i was so glad that you know i'd never 
I mean, we were talking earlier about, uh, you know, another reason I hate Florida. <laughs> it, it is my least favorite. Oh, yeah, favorite. that's your least favorite place. Yeah. It's my least favorite state. So where's the name, where's the other place you lived? You uh, lived in loads of places. Right? Yeah, we we lived. We moved to Lafayette, Louisiana, f- from Austin. Actually, what happened was, my dad somehow uh, was working in mining in Austin, and he got uh, he made a ton of money just with uh, there was some uh, mining deal that he was in on that that paid off really handsomely. And my brother recalls, I don't, but recalls coming to the kitchen table and my dad's just got stacks of hundred dollar bills really? and this is in the 1950s uh just sitting on the table and so we moved to north carolina from that from there because which is chapel hill north this carolina one, yeah. yep that's that's the area um yes 48 davy circle and the house is still standing um we moved there Wait, which house is it uh, it would be this white one, yeah. This one, yeah. Yes, that would be it. Um, and we moved there for a year because uh, my dad's cousin lived there, and um, and there was kind of a uh, nostalgia for it because it's where my dad met my mom. And so we lived there for a year. Um, I went to what you call year one over their first grade. I went to first grade in, in North Carolina. And then uh, then we moved to to Lafayette, which we actually lived, we lived in Lafayette twice. When this I was, one? No, that's Tucson. That, that came after Lafayette, Louisiana and uh, for a year. Uh, is this it? Uh Nope, then we're going that's Lincoln Way. That's yeah, we're that's going San forward. Francisco. We're going forward in time. Yeah. Uh, okay, North Carolina, and this might be. Yeah, I think I think that's. Uh, keep going. I think it would be. Yes. Yeah. That's uh, that's where we lived in Lafayette. Although that, I can't remember where we lived the first time because I was only three years old. But oh, because you went there and then went, oh, I see. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. went there and then Texas, then <coughs> then North Carolina, then back to Lafayette, and this is where we lived the second time. And what what were you like as a kid? Did you like did you like performing early on, or did that come later? Um, actually, my first real experience with performing came when we lived in Lafayette. Okay, um, and. We were doing your typical second grade Christmas pageant for uh, uh, our, for some reason, our classroom had a, a stage. Uh, and um, <clears throat> so we would have, uh, we had the usual thing where we tell the nativity story and each of us has about a paragraph that we've recited. And I'm, and we're holding up these little props and this kid next to me, is holding up the other half of the of you know some drawing of a the nativity scene or something and i say my piece and then he's going to say his piece and it was and he gets as far as oh. and and said and you know his parents just come running and he's going oh oh and and the teachers brian keep going and so i so i just said okay uh and I just did his part, and then I had to sing a verse of "O Little Town of Bethlehem" all myself. You know, but I, I remembered what what he said. My mom was watching, and she just said, "You were a natural up there." And so, so I thought, yeah, if that kid hadn't gotten sick, you know, maybe maybe things have been different. But yeah, I kind of knew by the time I was in high school. Uh, oh, we didn't even talk about where where we went after Tucson because we moved to. Uh, but anyway, uh, the next year. Uh, we moved to Tucson, Arizona, uh, for, for and which we lived, is this one. Yeah. This looks like Arizona to me. Yeah, we lived there for eight years, um, and so how old were you when you were here? Uh, we moved there when I was just before my eighth birthday, and we stayed there till I was fifteen. At which time, my dad he'd gotten his PhD at U of Arizona, and then we. Uh, <clears throat> um, we stayed another couple of years after that, and he uh, got a, a teaching position, a professorship at uh, university. In so some, your dad was like an academic? Yeah, that's what he aspired to. He was a geologist. 
and you know he'd gotten geology gigs after he got his PhD. Um, he was working for the government for a while, but he really wanted to teach. So we moved to uh, to Louisiana. Or Louisiana moved to. Uh, he got hired at the University of Redlands in Southern California, uh, in Redlands, California, which we didn't summon that one up, mm. but that's where I graduated high school and went one year to the university where my dad was, uh, was a, a professor. And it was during my final year of high school that I pretty much knew I wanted to be in show business because by then I was getting stoned every day and I'm, you know, driving to school because when you're, you know, when you're a senior, that means you've passed your 16th birthday and you probably have a license and our family had a car and so they had extra cars. So I was driving to school every morning. I'd, first, I'd drop my mom off at the school where she was teaching. Anyway, I'd smoke a joint and I would, on the way, and one morning I was just like, God, I, I hate being up so early in the morning. And there's this little, you know, I imagine the scene of, the little angel saying, oh, well, you're going to have to do that in your adult life too. And, um, and my, and then the, the devil appears on the other shoulder and says, screw him. We're going to, we're going to, you know, find something. You don't have to get up early in the morning. And that's kind of when I thought, well, yeah, rock and rollers, you know, they, and I was playing guitar by then. So, uh, I mean, the other thing that happened in Redlands was, you mentioned Rick and Ruby. Uh, the last year I lived in Redlands, I had dropped out of college. This is all around the draft dodger time. Um, and, but one of the other students there was this woman named Monica who became my partner, Ruby. But we became, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend before that. I mean, just. Oh, so you're together as well as. Yeah, we were together, act, you know, together yeah. as a, a couple. How was that? That must be hard. Um, it was all right during that time because we, you know, we. Uh, <clears throat> we lived together briefly after we moved to San Francisco. And it just so happened that she was leaving U of Redlands after her second year and was transferring up to San Francisco State University. And I was going to be moving up north with my friends. And we kept in touch. And then my friends and I formed a band that was just doing 50s nostalgia and a working clubs uh down, down from San Francisco. It's interesting to me that you'll be doing because <clears throat> obviously then the fifties wasn't so long ago, right? But it's already yeah, long enough that you could there, have like a. It was before nostalgia. Before act. things like uh, shows like Happy Days and, mm -hmm. and before Grease and all before they were, uh, but the there was a band and also you know uh, as far as musical reference in in America they had a a fifties revival band called Shanana that was the big big name. Uh, in that department, and over here they had Shawadi Wadi, but okay. they they came a few years later. Um, but you know we were kind of doing a '50s thing with some little comedy bits thrown in uh, that didn't necessarily reflect the '50s or or whatever. Um, but we were doing that, and uh, just me and my other two two friends. We had you know I was playing guitar, my other one friend was playing drums, and the other guy was playing saxophone and singing and uh, I went up to visit well her name's Monica but I, I went to visit her uh, and this drummer friend was come gonna come and pick me up she was already in San Francisco and we were living down the peninsula uh, but she you know he saw her and just said well we got to get her in the act and just and I said well you she did minor in drama so she probably has a flair for performing and that was, you know, I wasn't sure about it at first, but and, that was, and where where were you living when all that was happening? Uh, I was living in uh, near San Jose. San Jose, but, yeah. but she was already. Have we go down here, no. Uh, I, yeah, I didn't have San Jose on here, um, but I only lived there. You know, eventually, the band broke up, and that's when me and Monica decided to do it as a as a duo, mm -hmm. and we had one guy who really loved the band who was opening a. a club in San Francisco and hadn't really decided whether he's going to have entertainment or not. And so we came to him one afternoon, uh, just, we didn't even, wasn't even sure if we had an act, but we thought we could put one together. So, uh, he said, yeah, I'll give you 
you know, give you a night and give you a paid audition. So I mean, we, we only got $25 for the whole night, but, um, but they liked it. And, you know, we had maybe 10 songs and we just kind of padded, you know, I'm not sure how we got away with it because we had to do almost the entire evening. But, um, you know, that the career started right there. Um, and we got hired to do that room two nights a week and then other gigs came out of that. And we kept that going for uh, a couple of years. Uh, we're talking 72, 73. And uh, then started finding, I mean, finding other gigs uh, in the outlying areas of San Francisco. And then in 1975, we started working in Tahoe. And that's where we started taking it more seriously. And then... Where, where's Tahoe? Lake Tahoe is uh, about 240 miles east of San Francisco. It's a resort ski, skiing area. Um, not far from... It's about an hour and a half drive from Reno, which is the other major city. And about two hours drive from Sacramento. Uh, and we worked there, worked there for almost a year, or for over a year, and then decided... You know, we live in San Francisco. We should be working there. And so we uh, found that by then, in 1977, we met. Uh, we'd been working with backup bands, and sometimes that was good, and sometimes it was terrible because sometimes you're working with guys who have just been playing in their their garage for for a couple of years, and now they, oh, we're getting paid? Well, uh, then they start making demands and, you know, just being little divas and yeah, we were, yeah. it was pissing us off and it was just, either they'd be great, the professionals or they'd be amateur and whiny. And, uh, we met the perfect balance in, and by then Monica and me were just friends. Um, so you split up, but then we had to carry we, on doing we, the act. Yeah. We split up as a couple, probably about 1975 but continued doing the act because we just really liked each other's company. And and that was that an easy transition to go from yeah, well, we couple got, to Yeah, it was it had been kind of going that way, you know, because yeah. we both had other, uh, you know, we, we kind of had an open relationship for okay, a couple yeah, of years. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so we finally just decided to um, just make it a professional one. Um, and in 77... A lot of things changed. We met, I mean, this is 40 years ago. We met somebody uh, who we we were going to do a gig with a backup band, and he this guy booked our backup band for another gig. uh, And uh, he said, well, you know, my apologies for doing that, um, but I promise I'll come see you guys, and I'll get you some bookings, you know, uh, some good bookings, you know, because I realize this is uh, putting you at a disadvantage. So we said, cool, we met up with him and, he, you know, because he came to see us and he wasn't sure, but he uh, then about two months later, he saw us perform just an out, uh, afternoon gig in Golden Gate Park. And that was a, a turn, it's almost exactly 40 years ago. It was late July of 77. Should we be in San Francisco? Yeah, let's be in San Francisco because by then I was living at that house. At, you tell at, me at when we're in 12, San Francisco. 1232nd Avenue. Uh, um, that's LA. That's that's this is San Francisco, that's, right? Yeah, that's San Francisco. The holy, what used to be the Holy City Zoo, which was the first comedy room ever in San Francisco, and we did work that a couple of times. Uh, in its so early what type day. of people played there? Because that was a fairly prestigious venue, oh, right? Uh, actually, Robin Williams was a bartender there for a little while. Oh, okay, so that's where uh, he started. Yeah, he. he started. Would that be before he? That was did come yeah. That the, would have been about. <clears throat> 75 or 76 <clears throat> so how, how did you meet him how did you meet Robin Williams um, we met him <clears throat> when he was already uh, on the way up um, and they were going to do a remake of Laugh-In this is again all 40 years ago uh, they're going to do a remake of the TV show Laugh-In that had been really successful in the late 60s early 70s and they'd hire a new cast and Robin was one of those uh, in the cast and probably the only one that anyone ever heard of again. Um, but we saw him at a performance 
at the Great American Music Hall, which uh, was a place that we had worked, but were... That's on here too, right? Yes. Um, that's it. <clears throat> um, still exists. Uh, still a pretty major venue in the city. And we... Uh, uh, there was a show there that he was the, the closing act, uh, uh, showcasing all the people who were going to be on Laugh-In. And he just so stormed it. It was just amazing. Um, but we didn't meet him that day. But then we were working... A, uh, a little uh, a place called the other cafe which eventually became a major comedy room in san francisco but we were doing it this would have been late summer probably october or yeah early september of that year and robin just happened to be there and introduced himself to us <clears throat> and we stay you know he just said oh i think you guys are fabulous and um and so he uh <clears throat> we stayed in touch and uh, a few months later, there was an episode of Happy Days, <coughs> which he played. <coughs> I'm sorry. <Some> tea. <coughs> I've already done that. Uh, no, I'm Some fine. Water? You right? I'll be, I'm okay now. Uh, we did, uh, uh, he did the episode of Happy Days where he plays this, you know, Richie has this dream where he, you know, meets an alien named Mork from Classic, Ork. classic plot. Yeah. You know. I didn't know this. So they started off. It, so Mork and Mindy was like a spin-off. It was a spin-off oh. of Happy Days. And the and he just so completely stormed that one. And by then this laugh in show had already been cancelled. Um and you know, so Robin was just hanging around doing stand up. But he, you know, he's getting uh I remember seeing him at LA's comedy store in nineteen seventy seven and you know, just coming up and saying hi and he was like Oh, Brian, so great to see you, man. Uh, you know. So he spoke like that all that. You're making it sound like he spoke like he, he's in he, character. He all the spoke. Time. I, I thought he was English the first time I met him. Uh, so is he, uh, I mean, I guess. Oh, you guys are fabulous. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I would imagine, I mean, <clears throat> there's a few types of comics, right? I would imagine Robin's the type that he was on all the time, I imagine. Um, That's what you're making it sound like. Well, he had that, uh, that way of talking, but. Uh, he wasn't always doing doing jokes. He wasn't, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. I mean, he he was always thinking of stuff. But you could get him in a moment where he's just pensive and and just mm -hmm. talking normal. Mm -hmm. And those those were really good times. Um, where uh, so when he did the Happy Days show, <clears throat> we had a man, uh, this same guy that w had booked us on this, or, you know, taken our backup band away. He was now managing us because. He saw us perform at a at Golden Gate Park and just said, "Okay, I want to work with you guys." Um, and you know, within three months, we were just we were doing we were headlining Great American Music Hall, and we were doing <clears throat> this other place which doesn't exist anymore called the Boarding House, which was a a really the hippest venue in town in the '70s. And we did a lot of stuff there, a lot of, and uh, just working a lot and getting getting a reputation, getting, you know, the, the news media was writing articles about us and stuff. And, um, and, but we stayed in touch with Robin, but who was by now signed up to do Mork and Mindy, uh, or by, you know, by the, I guess after the happy days, almost immediately they said, well, we got to build a sitcom. So in September of 78, Mork and Mindy debuted and we started getting some gigs in LA, even though we were living in San Francisco, we working down there so every time we'd come to la so down there, comedy store yeah every time we come to la oh you, there it is <clears throat> every time we come to la gosh if you can you can probably find my name uh on the wall here if we go if you can scroll around to the side of the building it's on this this side it, it's on this side here All right, uh... that'll be interesting so these are names of everyone that played there, right? Yeah, anyone that was ever a paid regular. And I can mm. see it. You can see it? I'm pretty sure it's this one right here, if you can. That's as close as you can go. Oh, okay. Rick Wright. Yeah, it looks like that could be it, you know? Yeah, that, that is it. And Rick and Ruby's somewhere uh, on the... Oh, you're on there twice. Yeah, Rick and Ruby's somewhere in here. The curtain obscures it, but we were on that back wall. So, yeah, I'm on the wall one and a half times. <clears throat> um so anyway, um, 
um, Mork and Mindy starts and um, is a smash. I think it was the, the number two rated show of the entire year. And he, uh, you know, we stay in touch with him. And come 1979, he's getting booked for his first tour. And he just says to his management, well, I, you know, they say, well, you want an opening act? And he said, I, I have the perfect opening act. And they'd, they'd heard of us. So they said, yeah, that sounds good to us. So we did, <clears throat> um, you know, it wasn't like grueling six months or anything. It was, um, there was a, a week in New York, and then there was uh, a Midwest leg of the tour, which had Chicago, Milwaukee, Minneapolis, um, Detroit, and Cleveland. And, you know, some of those were great. Some were, yeah. Um, Chicago was disappointing to me, but all, all the other, Minneapolis was excellent. Um, they really, they got us. It was a very cool venue. Um, and, of course, Robin was just the, the king at that time. And the cool thing in Chicago, we got to hang out with Diana Ross and the Jacksons. Oh, really? Because... Well, they were at the show. They were at the show. They caught the last, the last 10 minutes of our portion. And at the end of the show, there was just this massive press and media hanging around Robin. And so Diana Ross and the Jacksons said, well, you know, we're just going to hang out with you guys because this is Robin's moment and we don't want to upstage. And, I mean, they didn't say it in those words, yeah, but yeah, they yeah. did, you know, they did just hang out with us. And so I'm, I have a photo of myself between, sitting between Diana Ross and Michael Jackson. Oh, really? Wow. Um, and Michael was much darker what, than What was he like? He was great. He was really, really nice. He was very shy. And he had acne, which made me think oh, really? this is why he... Uh, well, that's how he's he doing all the, the draft. Huh? Well, this is, how, this is why he's <laughs> yeah. doing all the... the the, oh, the surgery, the surgery yeah, yeah. was to remove the scars and just went overboard with it. So did you find a kinship there with the, the, uh, well, the acne? I, I, mean, imagine, I, I don't know I, if you pulled it Yeah, up, I didn't but. say it. <clears throat> no, we are just meeting but the guy. would have been a folk. Uh, but no, he's, you know, the, only, the brothers were, just, it's kind of interesting. The other brothers, they weren't all there, but I think there was Randy and Jackie and, uh, and Tito were all there. And, and they're, they're all wearing sunglasses. Michael's not. And, uh, but everything I said, those other guys laughed at. And I just, I'm always nervous when, when somebody, does, you know, there are people just, it's a natural reflex that yeah, you say, yeah, yeah. you say something and they just, they just have a laugh uh, to go with in response. Um, and the Jackson brothers were kind of doing that, but, but Michael was just very straightforward. And, uh, you know, I was, I was feeding him lots of compliments, and he just—he was very, very kind. And actually, we talked more to Diana Ross than anyone else. And, and what, what was she like? Uh, contrary to everything that I had read about her, and and what a loony she was, just really, you know, really being normal with us and being being cool. And she, uh, she said, "Well, I, you know, because Ruby did an impression of her, and she." Just came in after we'd done it. Oh, really? Uh, I mean, she just has sat down at her table. So was the impression like? Was it like mean? Or? It, it was. It was. Because that's something people could either love or. <clears throat> well, uh, what she did. To parody someone is kind of. A, yeah, what she did more affection. than than do the, uh, you know, perfect reproduction. She she could do the facials, so that. I just remember what she'd do as Diana Ross before she'd sing. She'd go, uh, Ladies and gentlemen, may I say, you have been much more than I would have ever expected it to be of mm. it to be. You know, just yeah. nonsense, uh, which Diana Ross was really good at that. Or just, let me let me say. Yeah. Uh, um, so, yeah, it wasn't necessarily a slam, uh, but... You know, probably better if she didn't see it because I, yeah, I had yeah, some yeah. trouble with, uh, not trouble, but there are people I did impressions of in my act that uh, one of them thought it was funny and another one I wasn't even doing an impression. I was just talking about, but I, I had a uh, a major confrontation. Well, who was that, if, to, you, if you can say? The late Tupac Shakur. This is you a, had a confrontation with Tupac? Yeah, in 1996. <laughs> Why? Um 
But at the time, you know, this was in my solo career, which started in 1985, by the way. Um, but yeah, 1996 was about a month before he was shot and killed. Um, and he's with his posse. I didn't know he was there, but uh, I had this whole thing. I Where was, was it? The at, store? It was at the Comedy Store, yeah. yes. In, uh, they have three rooms. Uh, this this one here is the main room, which is uh, about a 300-seater. And then the original room, which is here, is that seat's about a 120 maybe. Right. So anyway, I'm on stage in the main room. <clears throat> yeah, there's, there's the entrance to the main room. Um, I'm on stage, and I was talking about gangster rap back then and saying, you know, all these gangster rappers, they, they sing about killing cops and raping women and robbing Korean grocers, and they wonder why the cops are following them anywhere. And so I you know, get a little, uh, go, hello, McFly, you know, duh. Yeah. Uh, then, I, then I say, uh, and who's this other guy, one who'd gotten shot recently, a toothpick or six-pack? The guy's or... there, toothpick's there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, but, I, you know, I didn't take it any further than that. Um, so doorman comes up to me after I get off stage. He says, man, I can't believe you did that shit with Tupac in the room. I said, really? He's in the room? I'd love to meet the guy. Uh, you know, he's, he's talented. You know, um, it's not my favorite kind of music, but he's good at it. And so I, I get introduced to him and he's sitting at his table and he just goes, well, I realize you doing your jokes, uh, and, but just for the record, I never robbed nobody, I never shot nobody, I never raped nobody. And if I didn't think you were, was kidding, I got four guys here who make sure you don't leave the room. And I, Was he saying it in jest or do you think No, he was he saying was it. Serious. He was being serious. He was yeah. saying it to me. And I said, well, obviously you weren't listening because I never said that you did those things. The, and I recreated the entire scene for him. And he goes, You're saying the opposite of that. Yeah, yeah, I was. I wasn't implicating him at yeah, all, yeah, yeah. and so he he backed off. He said, "Okay, that's cool," um, and I couldn't wait to get away from him. And just go, wow, he you know he's he's so full of himself. He thought I was uh, accusing him. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think I even went so far as to say, uh, "Look, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that you did those things unless you were actually convicted of doing them." You know, I'm not I'm not that. I guess in his world though, you would he would have to. Well, yeah, I'm the enemy, Keep of course. Keep that image, right? Yeah, and uh, it could be because a month later he was dead, and it was probably okay. because... Because uh, of you, he, huh? Well, probably, because yeah, I mean, somebody blamed me you know, along <laughs> the way. But it was probably, you know, that he said the wrong thing to the wrong person. Um, and, you know, they just... It was in Las Vegas where he was shot and killed. And then about six months later his rival you know notorious big was also shot and killed in la and they've never arrested a single suspect in either one of those you know it's just like nope not interested <laughs> um you know, we're not even going to go there you know um but you know of of celebrities i met who had a sense of humor about it you know peter frampton i used to do a whole thing Im imitating that vocoder guitar oh, sound yeah, yeah. And and this, you know, and then just going, you know, what a legacy he left behind, huh? And he thought it was funny, you know. That guy's records are always in the charity shop. That, I've noticed that. that Peter Frampton comes comes alive in every charity shop. That's exactly what I said. Yeah. So you, you, gee, you sure find a lot <laughs> You're of doing Frampton. Well in charity shops. Yeah, you, you sure find a lot of Frampton albums in charity shops yeah. now. Um, and you know, it was two shows, and I was I was opening for the guitar god of the week uh, it was joe satriani i was opening for who was a rick and ruby fan it turned out because oh, really? he was based in oakland when he was building his career and he'd, he'd seen us a couple times and really liked it and it's the only time this ever happened where i opened for somebody who asked for my picture because he just oh, said really? and so i gave him a picture and it was really nice and then a little later uh, i come in I, uh, they supplied me with nothing in my dressing room and he had a full spread so I just kind of came in and said can I get a coke from you guys and uh, you know I, granted I didn't knock and wait you know, I just kind of wandered in because I thought well we established something and he's just like please you know he was like indignant about the intrusion and then in between shows he's got all these press and media and Frampton hanging out with him and but he didn't want to bring them in his dressing room 
so he brings them into mine. Oh, really? And so it's okay that way around, but yeah, not the other yeah, way they're having a party, mm. and he tried to apologize, you know, because I had to change clothes with people in the room because yeah, I couldn't get, yeah, yeah. Uh, I couldn't be loud enough to get them out. So, um, so he kind of said something. Yeah, you know, you can tell me to get the fuck out of here now if you want. I said, well, it's too late. You know, you already, you already brought the people in. Um, you know, you already infringed on my space, and you kind of went counter to what, you know, you were pissed off at me just for coming in by myself. So, dressing room politics. <clears throat> eh? Yeah. So he didn't didn't say anything more after that. But I just said, you know, I don't, <laughs> I don't care that he was a fan of Rick and Ruby. I think he, he was being a dick, um, and. That was where Frampton he, he came up to me just before I was going to go on to start the second show. And he just said, hey, so go easy on me, okay? But he was smiling and laughing. Yeah. So, so I just thought, okay. He's he's had every bad critique. So a simple throwaway line like that for me isn't, isn't going to ruin his day yeah, or anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah there's, yeah, there's a lot to be said for being humble, right? <clears throat> yeah. If you can get to a certain point and just be... Yeah. Relaxed about it, but um, yeah, and parody is a good test of that. <clears throat> if you can, yeah, yeah, I, let people take the piss. Well, away. and I had one other confrontation with a comic uh, who is very famous in America, Andrew Dice Clay. Oh yeah, um, at the comedy store because I had written a, a song parody to the tune of American Pie that was about the comedy business, and there was one one version of it that his name was mentioned. And I didn't know he was in the room, and he did not take. And what did you say? What did you say in the song? <clears throat> uh, it's toward the end of the, the song. It's, and the three men who won't go away, Polly, Tom Arnold, and Dice Clay, kept getting richer every day. The day the humor died, and the chorus went bye bye to the comedy store. Drove my Chevy to the Improv, but they bolted the door. Um, but there's names scattered about throughout the whole thing. I did, you know, two full verses and. Uh, <clears throat> you know, comment on who else was uh, popular at the time, and I, and I updated it from time to time. But Dice was in the room, and he did not like it. And I didn't know he was going up next. He was going to do a little guest spot. And meanwhile, the audience just loving it, and 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 I turned to the piano player, "Who's up next?" And he says, "Dice Clay." And I go, "Oh, perfect." And, oh my God. you know, I did. You always have a special skill for if you reference someone, they will be in the room. Yeah, it was. It was Tupac a, and now Andrew Dice Clay. Yes. Um, but Dice. You Maybe know, you're just unlucky. <clears throat> yeah, I was a little unlucky there because I had alternate ways of doing that same line. I was going to, you know, there was another of the same line where I just talked about. Depending who's in the room. Yeah, the Wayans brothers, which I could have gone to. Yeah. Uh, and the four brothers who won't be gone Damon, Marlon, Keenan, and Sean. Um, but I opted for the Dice Clay version and it turns out Dice was in the room. So he ripped me a new one when he did, he spent a good amount of time just, but never really said anything. And then a couple months later, I just happened to catch him on stage and, and what is this Rick Wright? He's a, you know, you've probably seen him around here. He's got a guitar and acne and used to be with a partner. She's gone on to you know, be a teacher and have children and all he's got is fucking guitar and you know he's just you know, what his problem is he's an ugly retard and I thought Jesus he's had months to really dig and that's the best he can come yeah. up with is ugly retard to be fair that is quite an Andrew Dice Clay thing to say though yeah that, that's the best he could <laughs> if do if it was cleverer than that it would have been weird yeah uh, I'm, I'm, I guess you're familiar with within, his within yeah. his persona right yeah, and he's still doing the same stuff, even though, just like uh, his idol Elvis, uh, he dyes his hair too. Um, you heard, <laughs> you didn't hear it first here. <laughs> it's, you know, it's pretty well known. Um, I mean, I've got eons of adventures from the comedy store, and I was so glad to work there. As a po I mean, I eventually started working down the street at the Laugh Factory, which is also on Sunset. And actually, Alan, could we walk there? How uh, long would it take? Well, I say walk, I mean click. Let's see. Might might be able to we get there. Um, so what, you can tell me what, so what was the Laugh Factory like? And we'll talk uh, about it. The Laugh can... Factory was kind of the, it was the little upstart club that eventually became a pretty good franchise. And um, let's see. 
are we at? Oh, so much of this has changed. Uh, yeah, it's still further down. Uh, it it's before La Brea, but yeah, after Sweetser. Um, where are we at here? Yeah, we just passed the Chateau Marmont. Uh, yeah, it's further so, than that. That's where John Belushi died. Oh, really? Was that a hotel? Yeah. It was, you know. Um, did you ever get to see him? Or was that before your time? I did meet John Belushi um, in New Year's Eve 1979 at uh, this big house. Uh, yep, it's just after this, this next intersection. Because there's that, yeah, this is it. Oh, yeah. La Laugh Factory. I started working there in the early 90s. Um, okay. Well, Lee Camp's working there now. He's, he stayed at my house five years ago. This guy? Yeah. yeah he, he's very political. Um, but, yeah, I started working there. And for some reason, the owner of the comedy store didn't have a problem with people working the Laugh Factory. But... She really had a problem with people working the improv, which was the okay. other the other big room in L.A. Why well, was that then? Was that because she had a long thing yeah she had yeah. a long running feud with the owner. Um, they met each other once and just hated each other, and that's the way it stayed. Um, they're both still alive, but they're both you know. Uh, I think they're both born the same year. I think they're both eighty seven now, so and not doing well. Uh, but anyway. Um, yeah, I, so I, I worked Comedy Store and Laugh Factory right up until, uh, I mean, by the time the late 90s came around and I was in my late 40s, that's when, uh, you know, the, that whole industry just said, well, we got younger fish to fry. And so we really, you know, I was just hanging around. I was doing a lot of odd jobs. Um, I would, I'd freelance as a stage manager for different theater productions and I did some work for my dad and just anything else that would come up that would uh, add to the comedy income. And occasionally I'd do the road. Um, but by 1997, 98, I mean, I, and I'd gone to Australia in 1997, um, which kept me going financially for several months. Um, I was there for six weeks. And um, that's, that's when I was first discovering uh, after working the the aforementioned the, the Korea Japan then discovering oh uh, Australia and then uh, did some gigs in Canada in 1998 but they're they becoming fewer and farther between and I, I was in a marriage that was floundering and we split in 1999 and by then I was really except for getting the occasional corporate I really wasn't doing much and there was a friend of mine who was in England, who had worked the comedy store in the 80s, but uh, really wasn't getting anything from them. And he inherited some money. And so he, was, he had a house in L.A., a house in New York, you know, a, a, a hotel room in New York and a flat in, uh, in Notting Hill in London. And he's saying, you got to come over here, man. There's, there's a lot of work. And I said, well, it's got to be better than what I'm doing now. And he was producing a show at uh, Edinburgh, um, just a, a charity show, but he was getting a lot of good people involved. Um, Zach Galifianakis was in that show, mm -hmm. and I think Rich Hall was uh, uh, Shazzy. So it was like American acts. In uh, Edinburgh. It was a it was a mix. You know, he he got some British acts too. Uh, I remember he had Shazia Mirza. Oh yeah, for the first time I'd ever met her. Uh, I think Hattie Hayridge. Um, Earl Oaken was probably on that oh, yeah. show. Uh, <clears throat> and um, so I got in on that one. Um, and I, you know, so in, in addition to that, you know, I, I didn't have work papers over here, but I didn't need them to work Edinburgh. So that's what I told the customs was that I was just, just going to be at Edinburgh. But I wound up doing, uh, my friend got me a gig at the Frog and Bucket through his his friend that Frog and Bucket in Manchester, which was that was my first UK gig, and well, we might have ooh, there it is, that's it, uh, Frog and Bucket Manchester, 
and I did two nights. First night, <clears throat> I was up in the middle, and it was great. And then the second night, they, I mean, I did well enough that the headliner struggled, so they switched us. And I was worried, you know, since I didn't have work papers, I thought, gosh, he could call the authorities and they could just send me home and you know I'd, uh, is that uh, a serious fear or was that just you being it was me being paranoid yeah yeah um, that's something that no one would probably think to do yeah but yeah it didn't matter I mean I I had a great weekend there and then uh, <clears throat> a few days later he uh, my friend also got me a gig at the King's Head mm. downstairs King's Head which which is near where you live now yeah, right In yes London. yeah um, there oh. There it is. And how how was it for you though being a an American act? Did you did you feel our audience reacted um, to you differently? Um yeah, at first, you know, there was uh, actually I was reacting with a little bit of awe over the whole thing because I'm just like, wow, I'm I'm working, you know, it's a place I'd been wanting to go since 1964 mm -hmm. because, you know, we got the Beatles and I I was finding out yes about the english music but i was also finding about the english comedy and <clears throat> you know we loved monty python when i was when I, they showed those shows over there didn't get the two ronnies i you know we huh? we got it oh, on tv I but i i did not yeah. i just it was a little too english for yeah, yeah. what a lot, i a lot of wordplay stuff what right? i knew back then um and you know we'd get the occasional uh upstairs downstairs kind of shows okay. um and yeah there was a lot of shit too right yeah i, I wasn't i wasn't blown away by um my my first wife loved yeah. duchess of duke street and, and i'm just know. going you know why should i care about 19th century rich people in england yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but then you know flat, so had, had you kind of romanticized the idea of england well and how did it measure up to your <clears throat> idea of what yeah it was? when i was uh, well, I was thinking about it with uh, with Rick and Ruby. I just thought I, for some reason I think our act would go over really well in in Britain. Yeah, and we didn't <clears throat> didn't really pursue it because we just didn't have the we didn't have passports then. We didn't have the <clears throat> that kind of extra money. Can we pause it for a second? Can we get a drink? Yeah. So Back. where where were we? Yeah, um, I've just noticed how you're talking about you coming to England. Look how different that is as a venue that. Mm. So that, <laughs> yeah, like that's one of the most established ones in England, just architecturally. Yeah, uh, there's. I mean, that's um, that's so older. that's so English, yes. Um, and actually, this was a thing I remember was uh, coming to the King's Head the first time. It was uh, August of two thousand, and um, seeing you know getting there before the show started, so it was still daylight, and seeing the area around and just going, wow, I could. I could live here, you know, just seeing. Look, you might be in the window here. Look, yeah, I've got posters. Oh, uh, let's see. From a silhouette, that looks to me like a bit like Sean Walsh. Don't know if it is or not. Yeah, sometimes. I mean, Peter does occasionally uh, throw my picture in the mix there. Uh, anyway, what are you saying? So you so, came here. So I did. Did the King's Head and it was great and and you know that coupled with the, the weekend in Manchester, I was like, I really want to work here and uh, so, but I was going to need to get get papers and you know get work papers, and my friend couldn't really help me with that. I mean, he was uh, independently wealthy, so he could just be here and and not worry too much about it. Um, I mean, I think he was paying. Just, just for staying there. Where do you live, by the Where would I go to find your house? Um, if we were walking? Yeah, up that road. Because we can walk actually, there as you tell actually, me about e either, either way. You can you can do either one. So anyway, yeah, so you, you needed uh, to get the work papers. So, um, and what he, what my friends, he said, well, there's this one guy who specializes in importing acts uh, named John Keyes. And he... Um, and he's in with the customs people. He can get the work papers. So um, my friend gave me John's email address. I, I sent him an email saying, you know, Stephen has told me about you, um, that you're the guy, you're the one to go to. Uh, and he, he responded. He said, uh, well, yeah, just uh, send me a video. You don't have to redo it for, yeah, keep going. Uh, 
you don't have to re, re you know my my VCR will will take you know either format so I sent them a video and within a week of me sending it he emailed and said uh, this is the first thing I've seen in the last six months that made me laugh out loud so when do you want to come <clears throat> and I said well because by then it was mid-September oh and <laughs> this is how things had deteriorated I was working <clears throat> for I was working pretty full-time at a yoga studio as a janitor not exactly not a, a te- I was gonna say a yeah, teacher then. not a, not exactly a, a career choice now here's yeah this is where I run the pub quiz every Tuesday ah, okay. Shaftesbury Tavern <clears throat> in fact fan, on the pan on the window there that should be quiz night oh this is an older photo okay because they have they have so posted a regular gig then though. I was yeah. supposed to say that yeah every Tuesday I oh. yeah this that's a couple years ago that um but keep going uh yeah no no you turn down this road and that's that's Shaftesbury Road yes cool that's where I live so this is where you're living now yeah you? um Just leave it there. so what we did uh so anyway between my first email to John and my first gig in London and first gig in England, uh, it was six weeks where I just, where it just all came together really and fast. And you moved straight here? No, I did, uh, did two weeks here and really, really liked it. And then started, and I also, by then my divorce was final, my second divorce. And I had met somebody at a wedding who lived in Germany. I mean, she was American, but she lived in Germany. And so... I thought, well, that's, you know, that's close enough. So I, I do a bunch of gigs in like, uh, I remember coming for the first, for two months, beginning of 2001. And during that time, I went to Germany twice to visit, you know, I'd just fly out on a Sunday. And, uh, since most of my gigs were Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So I just fly back on the Tuesday or Wednesday and, and see her for a couple of days. And sometimes she'd come to London and it actually was better when, because I was still, I still thought I had things to do in L.A. I was still living in L.A. And so I would like, uh, that year I flew back and forth from L.A. to London six times. And I also flew to Germany about six times. So uh, the credit card debt I already had amassed, it actually went further up, even though I was working a lot. Um so the girl lived in Germany. The girl lived in yeah, Germany, yeah. yeah. Um, we f- we broke up at the end of the that year, and then come 2002, I gave up my f- my place in L.A. and just kind of put my stuff in storage in San Francisco for a while. And but I was getting like, you know, plenty of work, so I'd I'd do three month stretches in uh, in U.K. and then just come back to U.S. for three weeks or so and. <clears throat> And eventually, um, in 2003, I met wife number three. Um, we moved in together toward the end of the year and um, got married in 2004 and then got divorced in 2009. And I was still working. I mean, the work was just starting to slack off a little bit toward the time that we split up. Um, but it's, it's a shame, yeah, getting my love life and my a career working in sync. Yeah. Right. You're either doing <clears throat> good in one or good in the other. Yeah. Um, you know, when I was married the second time, the first few years we were together, because we were married nine years, my fr- second wife, uh, we met in 86, and I was working a lot. There's a lot of, a lot of road stuff. And it was already starting to fall by the time we got married, and then we spent the last half of the 90s just really struggling. Because it just couldn't have the consistency anymore, and I didn't like going on the road that much because I, you know, because uh, I had a, a a home and a marriage yeah, yeah, exactly, and stuff. Yeah. So uh, she finally we split in '99, and that's when I, um, you know, just like the end of my first marriage got me out of San Francisco, the end of my second marriage got me out of L.A. Um, the end of my third marriage. Um, there's just a bit of messing about, um, you know, there was, I was still gigging a little bit, you know, making enough to survive, but not, 
<clears throat> not doing not doing great. And then uh, in 2010, I, I you know I'd go to go to the states and do a little little bit of gigging, and then come back. And I was living I was living in Essex. That uh, my second my third wife was from there and still lives there and uh, probably always will live there. She just full on Essex girl. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, you know, it shouldn't have happened really as, uh, as far as a marriage, it it was very acrimonious for a while. Now we're friends, but, um, I met somebody through online dating in 2010 that was the ideal person and she lived on Shaftesbury road. Down on yeah. your same road, just coincidentally. Yeah. Well, I wasn't. I was still living in Dagenham, Essex, oh, at that time, um, and she, uh, <clears throat> but she was living in this co-op um, that you know had been going for years and years, and the uh, and there's uh, and the um, because they were a co-op, uh, the the rent was astronomically low when when i when she told me what she was paying for a one bedroom flat in north london i was just going how is that possible because this I, is a really nice area as well yeah it's a lovely area and i was you know i thought i was doing really well li- living in a you know i was living in a two-story house in dagenham and paying 800 a month which was not bad <clears throat> but it was dagenham you know which is really far away yeah, from yeah where I want to be. Anyway, so I meet this woman, uh, and, you know, it was within, well, a few months later, we, you know, got really serious and went to the States. I mean, this was a, a great woman who we uh, had amazing, and she was almost exactly the same age as me. So we uh, went to the States. She met everybody, had a, had a great time. And then a month after we came back, she was diagnosed with cancer. And within a year, she was gone. And so... This is your sad memory, isn't it, I think? Yeah, this is where um, she... Uh, you know, by the beginning of 2013, she knew that... Because uh, <clears throat> she'd had chemotherapy, and it kind of it shrunk the tumors a bit. But eventually, it didn't... Uh, you know, she felt the same sensations and just go, I think it's back. And she did, did diagnosis. And they said, well, obviously the chemo didn't work as well, but we have another form that uh, is not quite as reliable. And and she just said, you know what, forget it. And so she just said, I, I just want to get my novel published and we'll do that. <clears throat> and she did get that done. Um, but uh, she died in March and... Um, as a result, because, well, two things, uh, because one of her best friends in the co-op was really impressed by how I took care of her. I pretty much threw everything else aside. I was commuting from Dagenham every day, um, and spending, you know, cooking her meals for her and, uh, running her errands and so on. And, um, So one of the people in the co-op who lived in a, a shared house situation um, knew that there was going to be a vacancy at, at the shared house, and so she offered it to me. And there's a waiting list of probably 100 people that want to, that want to join this co-op because, you know, the chance to pay low rent and live in a nice part of London. Yeah. Right in the lottery, right? Yeah. So, uh, but she just liked the way I took care of my girlfriend and said, you know, this is the kind of people we want in the co-op. So uh, that was, I moved in in June of 2013, um, but not to the place that she lived in, that my late girlfriend did. And, um, you know, so I've been there ever since. It's just past her fourth anniversary there. Um, That's on Shaftesbury. That's on Shaftesbury. A shame that me and my girlfriend never had a chance to be neighbors, but, you know the and I, you know if she hadn't had cancer maybe we'd still be together but ultimately i've met a perfect person now too so uh, and she's older but she's 
very wise and very and a lot of fun. Oh, and I I know that car. That car has been there forever. Mm. Um, th- that might be my car. <laughs> Your car. Luckily, the number plate's blurred out. Yeah, but it might well be. Mm-hmm. Um, no, actually, it's the one right behind it. Definitely. How about that? Yes, that is definitely my car. <clears throat> so, you know, uh, um, so I've been with this woman for two years now, and in fact, we're going on holiday Monday, going to Spain. Nice. Um, but Are you sure you don't want to look at Spain just on, <laughs> on here? Well, <laughs> yeah, I I still can't remember the name. We're going to Ronda for the first few days, um, and then the. No, I think you should go on an actual holiday. You don't. Uh, I kind of remember when those when the that paint, paint. was on the was on the street. Yes, <laughs> memories. Uh, that was about two you got years ago. What did you say about the paint? Mm. <laughs> Must have spilled out of a truck or something. Um, but yeah, she and I she and I met again. All this is part of the legacy of my late partner. Is that mm. I moved to Crouch End or Crouch Hill actually is where it is and just started meeting all these new people and uh, got the, the quiz gig at the Shaftesbury through uh, uh, the guy who was running the quiz there uh, who was also American and his visa had expired and he just, I, I just said, you know, I think I could do this. And he, so he said, yeah, the gig's yours. And so I did it. I mean, the, the, the club, the Shaftesbury closed for about six months for refurbishment, but when they reopened, you know, they fully intended to have me. So that was kind of cool. Um, that happened. And then I joined this choir that I'd seen performing in Crouch End Festival. You're in a choir? I'm, a, I'm still in a choir, uh-huh. yes. Uh, we just had our final get together Wednesday for, you know, f- before splitting for the summer. Um, but we, you know, I met this woman, Maggie, in the, in the same choir because we'd uh, quite often. We'd go to the Earl Haig pub for after after rehearsals just to hang out and have a drink or so. And I wound up sitting next to Maggie once, and we got to talking. And then the next week we got to talking more and more and more and more. And then we split for the summer, and I just said, well, I want to keep seeing you. I don't want to just wait till September when we start up again. And, it, you know, she was, she was very keen on that. So two years later, and we still sing in the choir together. Um, it's a nice little romantic story, you know, that the two, uh, you know, we met singing in the choir. So guys, this is a great place to meet chicks. <laughs> so that kind of thing. Um, but what type, what type of music are you singing? It's a mixture. Well, about half is not in English. You know, so you find these, uh, African chants or, oh, okay. uh, uh, so it's not like church music. No, it's not definitely not church music. Uh, there might have some religious overtones like, well, in our last performance, we did Hallelujah, Leonard Cohen. Oh. Um, but that's not really a religious song either. Um, so uh, but we do that. So all these things happen because of meeting uh, my late partner because I got involved in this, this whole scenario. And then um, my other gig that I'm doing every, every Sunday is DJing at the King's Head on the upstairs because the lady that, that was taking over as manager a couple of years ago um, remembered me from that they would have bring your own vinyl night there. And she just, you know, was there almost every week and just said, I really like the stuff you got. And then she texted me one day and says, I think what we want to do is just have you bring your vinyl and play it. Um, it's bring your own vinyl night. That's only you. But it's only me. Yes. <laughs> and we did that. Initially, she had set me up downstairs, which was a waste, you know, because you know, people yeah, would hear the listening. people would hear the music, but uh, very few people would actually say, "Yeah, to go back to King's Head, you got to go the other way." Oh yeah, that's um, right. We can wander down this way. Oh yeah, this Hornsey Road. Um, not the so. Group. What are you doing now? Are you st- are you still doing comedy now? Or? Yeah, just but it's very sporadic. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I I had a three month period where I did no no comedy at all and then I did a gig and do you miss it though in those periods or not um, there's certain things I don't miss I mean I still when the crowd is behind me it's great um, on the 20, 24th of June I did this gig in Felix Stowe 
that everything about it looked really scary because it was an Armed Forces Day event. So it was going to be a lot of Brexit voters, uh, a lot of very conservative people. And it was the same day as Glastonbury. Not that I go to those those things, um, but, you know, it was pretty much the anti-Glastonbury. Uh, just in, If Jeremy Corbyn had shown up there, uh, he wouldn't have gotten such a great reception. Theresa May would have done better. Um, but, you know, they were just real simple folk. And, and Felix Stowe is just, you know, it, it's really not much of a beach town. It's it's just cold and windy and the, the water, the beach is all rocky and it's, uh, you know, I'm spoiled, California beaches, you know. So um, so to go to, uh, um, to go there and do a gig, uh, we stay at this really horrible hotel. Uh, uh, you know, Matt, my girlfriend went with me. Um, but and I was really afraid of the gig because it was a family show, which meant I couldn't swear. And I had to do 45 minutes, which I hadn't done that amount of time in a while. Clean. 45 minutes of clean was just really asking a lot. But somehow I just found stuff from the archives and took I, part of my act anyway is taking requests. And I've been doing it long enough that virtually every act they can throw at me, I have some bit that I can do with it um and if nothing else you know what i emphasize to them you know the more the song or the act sucks the better the chances i can do something yeah, with it yeah, yeah. um and so yeah, you don't want to do some cool band or something it doesn't yeah and doesn't i work. and i'm you know and if somebody requests you know somebody that's really contemporary or you know really uh, alternative, shall we say? I just go, oh, like I'm supposed to know every you know, every flavor of the month band out there, yeah. uh, or if it's a band I never heard of, I go, what? Some friends of yours that need a plug? Uh, what, <laughs> you know, just the the lines accumulate over the years. Where we, uh, uh, and I, you know, I have great stories about uh, reasons to why I left L.A., which is partially true. I, I uh, political correctness. Uh, and it was kind of a dichotomy that I could go on stage. I went on stage two days after John Denver was killed in a plane crash, and I w- went on stage singing, he's leaving on a single-engine plane. And the groans and, you know, oh, too soon, boo. And, and, and like, Jesus, you, you guys, wait, uh, didn't we all want John Denver dead when we when he was popular? Uh, yeah. Uh, I forget my exact wording on it. Anyway, um, but the the worst, even worse than that, was the guy that came up after me was just a string of dick jokes, and the audience was loving him, and so I just embellished that story. Yeah, you know, they didn't seem to mind when some guy comes up and talks about his dick for an hour. He's a fucking genius, right? (laughs) So, um, so it was that kind of setup. I just thought, okay, I don't really. I don't want this scene. I mean, it was a couple more years before I discovered the English scene, which. And how, uh, how different is it here? <clears throat> like industry wise, obviously it's very different from doing comedy in LA. Yeah. Uh, if I was just living somewhere, you know, in the Midwest of the U S and just being a road comic, uh, it probably wouldn't have mattered as much, but, mm. but being in LA, they, uh, there's always people in there that are looking like, Oh, we're looking for the next big thing, uh, and most of them are. I always thought, most of the people that work in the industry are paid. To, they're paid to say no, mm-hmm. and if they say yes, they better be right, or yeah, they're, yeah. they're so gone. They don't want to take a risk. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, they'll go with the sure thing. Um, I do believe that if um, that Michael McIntyre were he an American act, he'd you know doing the same stuff. He'd he'd be he'd be huge in America too. Yeah, because there's uh, there's that that contingent that just see that's safe comedy. We don't mm-hmm. like we don't we want to bring our children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, I remember hearing a you know, remember Chris Tucker who was uh, in the uh, the Rush Hour movies, um, and he was a comic, and he was Michael Jackson's favorite comic. And I'm hearing quotes from. Yes, I love Chris Tucker. He's so funny, and I can bring my children to see him. And I, I'm going, but he talks about, you know, he says the N word. He talks about dick sucking yeah, and yeah. eating pussy. And 
Uh, what, Somebody, why am I collecting? Yeah, what, <laughs> yeah. What part of what part of that would you bring your children yeah. to? You know, I I didn't get that. Um, well, man. So, um, but yeah, it was those those kind of people. I mean, Jesus, I was I was like, in fact, one of my favorite moments where there, there's all these. I mentioned the Wayans brothers. You know, they were they're still their their offspring are now big in the states. That they, they just huge family to begin with and they're all multiplying so and damon is in a recent uh, recent series and i can't remember it was, it's a remake of some some it's some movie which I, escapes me at the moment anyway they're all still working um i was on stage i was going on at the laugh factory and going up before me was uh the one female in the wayans family who was doing comedy and her Kim and she you know she wasn't that great but she's she'd been on their show in living color because she knew you know her brother Keenan was the producer and one of the stars and I didn't realize that's who she was I just hear this girl talking about pussy farts and other important topics like that and then middle of so I was in France a couple months ago y'all been to France and just the way she, why would yeah. she go to France? You know, uh, where does she have the money to travel? And then when she said, uh, "Thank you very much," I've been Kim Wayans, and <clears throat> so the, the MC comes back on, brings me up, and a whole bunch of people get up to leave just because uh, it's uh, it's getting late in the evening and whatever. Uh, and I just go, you know, Rick Wright isn't my real name, but. I think I'm going to change it again because, you know, maybe if I change it to Rick Wayans, I'll get yeah, some work in this yeah. town. And how did that go down? Well, Kim was out of the room by then, so... Uh, so it, but it, did the audience get where you were yeah, coming from? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the the MC thought it was hysterical. <laughs> so, um, oh, man. That's cool, man. So I think we can come close to yeah the end of our journey. But what I like to do, a nice way to wrap it up is like... um, We haven't looked at everyone necessarily, but... It's had a nice sort of progression to it. But what I like to do is kind of revisit some of the places. Yeah. And then what I say is, um, like when you're a young man doing the comedy store, for example, if you could go back there now, or the Love Factory, if you could go back there now and like give yourself advice, the past Rick, if you could give him hmm. some advice, what would you say? Um... I'm not sure about that. I, 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 I'd like to say I was doing the right thing back then. That I was just, I just made sure to not complain when I wasn't getting the spots, and then, and and to not complain about anything. And you know, the, uh, what I remember back from then, it was probably from working with Rick and Ruby, and uh, at the time that we were doing the Rick and Ruby act. Uh, there was an active cabaret scene in San Francisco and around the Bay Area that we could get involved in. So, but if we had tried to start up in the 80s when they had a, their first comedy boom in the States, we might have been lost in the shuffle because uh, we're doing a duo act, especially on the road, is really difficult. Um, and unless you it's half the money as well, right? Yeah, you have to split the money because they, they have a certain budget for their headliners. And you know, if you don't get that, um, I, I really, I, I think I was very lucky uh, because um, I just seemed to find, you know, I just <laughs> would land on my feet. You know, I'd have some, some low moments. Um, you know, at, in 1985 was when <clears throat> uh, Rick and Ruby broke up for good although we still worked as far as a decade after that because um, people were, weren't convinced we were broken up, so they, yeah, we'd yeah, get yeah, these yeah. gig offers. But, um, you know, I just, I, I remember thinking, well, and I just ended a three-year relationship, or it was ended for me by the uh, who I was with, and so I'm thinking, well, okay, I'm alone here, and I'm without, and I'm not going back to San Francisco with my tail between my legs, I guess I better find something to do here. And I'd been toying with the idea of a solo act, but I, um, 
didn't wasn't sure where I could book it. So I went to the improv for their open mic night, and all I heard was people talking about, oh, what do you think of this joke I wrote? And I was already like, if you have to ask, it's not funny. I didn't ever say that, but that yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I I really I don't I still don't like when people do that. Um, so I just you put your name in this bowl and they uh, they draw the names and not everyone got picked. And once I was there for a while, I said I really don't I really hope I'm not picked, and I wasn't. And then I went um, I called the comedy store the following day and just said. Yes, I'm Rick of Rick and Ruby, and I'd like to uh, showcase for Mitzi. That's the owner's name, uh, Mitzi Shore. I said, I'd like to showcase for Mitzi. And go, yeah, we remember Rick and Ruby. Uh, yeah, I'll talk to her, see what, uh, you know. I'd, and I said, I'd like to showcase as a solo. And they called, so they said, yeah, call back tomorrow. We'll give you your, your time. And the time, so I called the next day, they said, yeah, you're on at 10.30 in the original room on Friday. I thought, well, that's a weird time for a showcase. That's like right in prime time. And I didn't find out until the following week that she'd already hired me as a paid regular. Just, in, yeah. Yeah, just put me in. Just thought, oh, he's, he's probably got 15 minutes. So, And I didn't realize that until I called back the next, the following Monday. Uh, so I thought, well, this is a waste of time. Plus I had to go on after Sam Kinison did about 45 minutes. And that, I think that's the lesson I learned all, way back is just don't be intimidated. Um, you know, if someone goes out and kills, you just got to have the confidence that what, what you have uh, will reach somebody. And I have no idea what I did that first night. But, um, you know, then I, I call and the first thing the guy asks the talent coordinator says, oh, we need your social security number. I say, well, what for? Uh, and I go, and I say, well, for taxes. I say, taxes? What? And so, yeah, for all the paid regulars, pay, mm -hmm. have, you know, have to have it on their 1099 forms. I go, oh, really? Uh, you played it cooler, right? You were like, well, yeah. but I was, I was being, still being pretty yeah. dumb, you know, because I, I, it took a couple. You mean that spot I did was a paid spot? You're, you're paying me $35 for that? And the, yeah, yeah. There's not in England like where you do certain like you always get paid for twenty like never for, well unusually for ten right yeah. over there you could do it's not a, well yeah each you could do it, the same amount of time but it could be for free or unpaid is that how it works um, yeah there would be uh, people opening you know the show would start eight o'clock I guess and uh, at least at the comedy store the first three or four acts would just be doing five to ten minutes and they would be free uh, they'd usually be doormen at the club um but yeah after that then each each act is doing 15 to 20 and um you know the pay has gone down since then they they only i think they only pay 15 dollars a set um, okay. but anyway so it's hard to get it's so hard to get in there but then you're only getting yeah. 15 dollars yeah, yeah yeah people are as long as people are doing it i mean they didn't pay anyone at all for a while yeah, yeah, they had yeah. a comedian strike in oh, 79 yeah. which everyone heard about um yeah, and the other thing that was funny was that's how I got, I, I got my name, my name Rick Wright, cause as a result. Because in the whole time of Rick and Ruby, I never had a last name, and so, but I'd had this girlfriend, who was into numerology, and had figured out Ricky Wright. That sounds like a good name for you, and I thought, yeah, it's all right, um, but it didn't come to surface fruition until, when I called. And they said, do you have a spot Friday? And they said, so what name do you want to go under? Because, you know, we can't just put Rick of Rick and Ruby. And I, I'm hemming and hawing. And said, well, you want to you want to go as Rick, right? And I said, yeah, Rick Wright sounds good. <laughs> and You weren't tempted just to be Rick. Yeah, I couldn't just go I Rick. That's quite, uh, I, I was, it's pretty street for I was you, trying yeah. Righteous Rick <laughs> for a while. Righteous Rick. But, cool, but, man. But, yeah, that... Um, just uh, again, things fall kept falling into my lap, you know, and, and with England and um, you know, just make making a little. <laughs> even with Rick and Ruby, we were uh, as all this media attention's going to us. We're going, who us? What? <laughs> What's so special about us? You know, we just do this little goofy act and uh, a few impressions here and there. And you still you still in touch with Ruby? 
Yeah. Yeah. She lives in Azusa, California, uh, just so, which is about 10 miles east of Pasadena. I don't know if you, have you been to LA before? No, no, no. Okay. Um, I don't think it's as bad as uh, people depict it. You know, I mean, there was the joke of what's the difference between LA and yogurt, and yogurt has a culture. Um, but, you know, I, I knew everything to hate about LA when I moved there. So when I finally moved there, I just said, well, I'm going to find things to like about it. And but I, do you miss it? Do you miss it ever? Yeah, my my girlfriend and I are hoping to go to go to the U.S. go to California in October, and she she's never really spent any time in L.A. and I'm, I'm thinking, well, this will be the time to just you know, because I really I want her to. Uh, there there are things to like about it. the the climate for one. It's just always, uh, you know, I mean, it get, there's a few days of the year it gets unbearably hot but there's never any days of the year where it gets unbearably cold so um you know for that do you think do you think when you go back there with her will you revisit some some old haunts oh yeah i mean we've done it now but it'd be nice to do it in real life right yeah i would yeah um well i definitely uh, my late partner i took took her to the comedy store yeah, yeah. Uh, and actually we went when a show was going on and there was only one person there that I remembered from the old days um, you know, cuz they just keep that lineup keeps getting younger and younger but um, it was still a trip and you know my picture's still on the wall there and my and my name's you know on the outside wall and um, you know there there's uh, yeah I I I don't know I I, I do I like San Francisco better uh, as far as just a pleasant city and with of most people uh, from this country would prefer San Francisco to L.A. just because it reminds them a little more of home. There's the architecture isn't like this. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's it's got some European influence to it. So anyway, um, yeah, I, th- I, I think that's I think we've covered, uh, you know, I mean, the only other thing going back to Robin, I was on an episode of Mork and Mindy. Oh, you were, yeah, which I said in the intro. How, how was that? The, um, it was terrible for me because I'd never acted. So uh, in the, you know, it's on YouTube. The, the episode's called Mork and Mindy Meet Rick and Ruby, so it's easy to find. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was 30 years old when we did that. And, um, you know, it was, Robin was going through a lot that week. Um, people were suing him for stealing jokes and uh so there's litigation and stuff. Yeah, what was the deal with that? Is it, was there any truth in that? I mean, were you close enough to him to know? Yeah, because, um, well, my favorite story was Ruby told him a story one day, uh, a funny story involving her family. The next day, Robin told the story to her, uh, changing the names, but as if it had happened to him. Oh, really? And he just <laughs> forgot. because he was so coked up he, he couldn't remember? Yeah, him. well, I don't know about the drugs, but he was just, you know absorbing so much they sometimes forgot where the source was yeah, yeah, yeah. so you know and do you think he was doing it sort of maliciously or he genuinely just forgot he, he would genuinely yeah he was not doing it you know because i've seen interviews with carlos mencia who's the renowned mm. the renowned comic thief in america where he just says no i i can make that joke better so you know i'm gonna so he, take like it he thinks it's his right to do it yeah, yeah. um it's always a weird one, that because I always think, why would you? Because being accused of joke theft is, you yeah. know, you know, Robbins was, it's gonna, was not. Yeah, it was never done yeah, with, yeah, with yeah. the, you yeah. know, like I'm going to steal that. But that's why I do it. <clears throat> yeah, but I com- think that's most of the time when it happens, that is what it is. Because why? Why would you steal something intentionally when the stakes are so high? Yeah, and do you know what I mean when you're just going to get shamed? But, but he got bad enough rep for that that. Mm. Uh, Comics would either refuse to go on if he was in the room, or they'd do their worst material. Um, oh, really? <clears throat> you know, if they could really think of a of a set that way, yeah, um, yeah. they you know just really didn't like him being there because they just thought, well, as one comic put it, you know, my act's been on Tonight Show, Letterman, and the Oscars, and I never left my room. So, um, and how is it? What about when uh, Robin Williams passed away? How, oh, how, how was, did you feel about that? Uh, 
I, I wasn't terribly shocked, especially to know that he, that he, that him he him topped himself. Well, I'd seen him about two years before. Oh, really? Um, and he was, you know, they, they have an annual comedy day festival in San Francisco at, in Golden Gate Park. And for years, Robin would always show up and, you know, just do a, do the closing of the ceremony and, and do, you know, do about 10 minutes of stuff. And, but when he'd come, there'd always be this chaos of everyone, you know, and particularly in this decade, people getting, wanting to get selfies with him. And, you know, after a weekend, uh, after being at the Comedy Day Festival, then suddenly there's all these comics whose Facebook profile picture has a picture of them with Robin. You know, so I just thought, well, that's, that's bullshit. Um, but what really made me feel good was he'd be besieged by these people, and I'd just kind of lean through the crowd, tap him on the shoulder, yeah. and he'd turn around and say, oh, fuck you, good to see you, yeah. motherfucker. You know, cause that's kind of the way we talked. It was just, yeah. we'd, we'd talk dirty to each other. Um, and it was kind of like, okay, I really want to talk to you. <laughs> Screw these people. So there was there was that kind of respect because we didn't see each other a lot. Um, I, I regret that he never got to meet. Uh, you know, he did meet my. You know, he was very good friends with my first wife, and he uh, he got along very well with my second. I'm sorry that he never met my third, or or that uh, my late partner never got mm-hmm. to meet him, because uh, you know he was especially coming to England. I mean, he he he'd come here a lot. Uh, usually, every time a movie would King's open, Head. I remember Peter telling me a story about that. Yeah, he he do King's Peter Head. Peter told me a story that he he's doing the King's Head and he, he couldn't find him, and he was due to go on stage, and he was in the toilets throwing up. Oh, uh, I heard and that. Peter framed it saying that he was nervous, right? He had stage fright. Hmm. Whether that was true, or not, I don't know. I'd heard that story before. Maybe it was yeah. Peter that told me that one. Um, but yeah, there, there there was a different. I mean, he's done concerts here, I think done concerts in England um but um yeah it was uh, uh, occasionally I'd hear him on radio too you know doing an interview but you know he'd come here whenever a new movie came he would come to the premiere um and so many of his movies were bad but you know, the ones I liked were the ones where he played the bad guy yeah. You know, insomnia and one hour photo oh that one hour photo that was creepy as hell yeah he really really threw himself into that one that was that was really uh amazing to see um but when he did the sappy stuff that you know patch adams and to some extent mrs doubtfire awakenings he was very good um but that was because he's working with de niro i did manage to see every movie of his uh, and some were great some were just you know terrible you know but you know that's the way it goes um you know, he's still got an impressive body of work, and you know, I was proud to be his friend and to have experienced when he was still on the up. You know that, that things were still uh, things were still moving that way. Um, you know, I mean, Jesus, the, you know, I've I've got this great photo montage at my house of uh, people that I met along the way, and so you know that that picture I mentioned of Diana Ross and Michael Jackson. Uh, there's a picture of me with Andy Warhol. You met Warhol and Harvey Milk. And, uh, what was it like meeting Warhol? It was great. He, you know, he invited us for a photo. At the factory. Or? Uh, he, he'd come to one of the Robin shows in New York, and so he was a fan of Robin Williams. Well, he, you know, he he was made Just around. Yeah, he, he I made guess a, he made it his business. He made a point around, to be yeah. around, but also through Robin. And being his, his opening act, we got VIP passes to Studio 54. So we, were, oh, really? uh, Warhol was there, too. But there was a day that we went, I mean, there was a party at Robin's Suite. He was staying at this place that was right on Central Park uh, called the Sherry Netherland. And there was a party up there, and Andy Kaufman showed up briefly. Um, and What was he like? Was he, he was very evasive. Like he, he was just like, yeah, good to meet you. I mean, he he okay. really didn't stay. Um Peter Allen, the singer songwriter, was there. Didn't really talk to anybody, and Annie Leibovitz, the famous photographer, was there. And then Warhol, who uh, seemed to find a fascination with the the fact that I was at that time I was married to someone who ran a secondhand shop. And I could imagine who it looked. So yeah, he. So the next day, 
we, with Robin, we went uh, with Warhol to all these charity shops in Greenwich Village. Oh, really? Uh, went, you know, with a limo. <laughs> and to the girl you were dating, her, her shop? Um, well, she was there with me in New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, but, um, yeah, and she, yeah, she went along with us. And But at the party, the Warhol, he apparently was interviewing me. Uh, and I wasn't aware Recording of it. You, yeah. He had a, had a little uh, little cassette recorder. And in he his, did that pretty pocket. much all the time, right? Like that's yeah. the only way he could sort of yeah. talk to people. And in the Warhol Diaries, he mentions going to uh, the Sherry Netherland and for a party, and then going to the ch- charity shops with Robin, but did not mention us. Cause oh, we, really? But you were there. We were yeah, there yeah, for yeah. all. Of it. We didn't, but we didn't get famous, so that's why he yeah, didn't mention yeah, so it. He went in the book. Yeah. We did do a photo session for Interview Magazine, which I think still exists. Um, but he, uh, he, you know, he was just wandering about the building. But the photos were really cool. I mean, what they did with all their photos was they didn't want anyone to smile. So got mm-hmm. a whole different perspective of what we looked like by s- seeing these photos of us, yeah, you know, yeah, with really yeah. stern expressions and stuff. But, um, you know, the... That was a you know, good good experience of coattailing because there we were, you know, opening for the biggest act in the universe and and catching some of the windfall from it and meeting Gene Simmons of Kiss while he was dating Cher. Uh, yeah, every night in New York, there was a different mm-hmm. different get, you know group of celebrities that would show up. So and we're just oh well, we're along for the ride, but they're liking us too. So what the yeah, hell? Yeah, yeah. Um, same thing. Was that nice in a way? It was almost like the pressure's off. You were just like, yeah. Well, there was still pressure. There was still pressure to be a a good act. Mm -hmm. And you know, there were a couple times. I think all the shows in New York went pretty well. Uh, But Chicago was, I think, what I, what I, I grew to like Chicago later. But that particular time, I just thought they're they're too obsessed with, you know, we're the we're the second largest city in America. But you know, you're in Illinois, you're not in California or New York, so you're, you know, you're not as relevant. But this guy who really liked our act and was sitting in front uh, reached out to shake Ruby's hand, and as he shook her hand, he gave her a quaalude, you know, which was the drug of choice yeah, yeah, back yeah. then. And and she's like, well, what am I going to do with this? And, and you know, <laughs> um. But the guy came backstage later and said, "Yeah, that really was a quaalude I gave you," and like we were going to be impressed by that. <laughs> I was never into that kind of stuff. I, you know, did cocaine, did marijuana, uh, did heroin once, just so I could say I did. Um, How was that? You didn't didn't get a taste for it, obviously. No, but I could see why people got addicted uh, to it. Um, but yeah, I've been pretty drug free since. Well, since I got married the second time in 1990, I was pretty much done with it by then. Yeah, yeah. You know, I couldn't imagine. I, I did have a hit of cocaine in about 2007. No, 2005 it was. And I remember it was at Jongler's, and I went b- back to the hotel room. So I was going to watch something on TV at 11 o'clock. And next thing I knew, it was 9 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it had the completely opposite effect. When I used to do it, you'd stay up until 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and here I was going to bed, and you know, somehow I got my clothes off. And oh, you cleaned. just fell asleep. I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I actually just I didn't. I know somebody does that, just does it before he goes to bed. I'm like, yeah, no, I, that is not the idea. Yeah, I did not. I, but, yeah, it used to be a, a stay awake kind of, yeah, yeah. kind of drug. So, Well, obviously the quality has gone down. Yeah. To such an extent, it's, oh. uh, it's become a downer. Now. Well, certainly wouldn't buy any now. Right. I All think right. that would do, man. I think that's been really cool. Yeah. We got, did you have a good time? Got, we got two hours in there, so you that was cool. edit the hell out of it. <laughs> right. So let's, all that's left to do now is zoom up into the sky. Okay. I've been Dave Green. He's been Rick Wright. This has been Dave Green's Street View Show. Make sure you subscribe, and I'll see you again on the next show.